Thanks, Blake, and thanks everybody for coming out to my last lecture. Uh, I don't mind admitting that I'm just a little bit nervous tonight, and I'm sure that Dr. Emil and Dr. Schaefer would say that that's a horrible way to start a speech. But I have to say that I find this whole concept of a last lecture to be a pretty daunting thing. To look back at my life and to ask myself, what have I done and what have I experienced that I can somehow provide lessons to the students at Baker, um, I, that's a bit of a profound responsibility. And I hope that uh, by the end of tonight, you all will hear something that you connect with and that you will walk away thinking that you've learned something, as opposed to leaving here and thinking it's 30 minutes of your life that you'll never get back. So um, as I was putting together my presentation, I realized that I had three areas that really shaped me and brought me to this point in my life. And each of those could be described with a single word that started with the letter F. So tonight I'm going to tell you about my F words and how they shaped and influenced me in hopes that you can also learn from them. I also um, learned about some of my colleagues who had come before me and what, what had they done in their last lectures. And a common theme was that if they had kids, they talked about their kids. And I'm certainly going to be no different. This is my daughter, Sydney. She's 11 years old. She's in sixth grade this year. And unfortunately, Sydney and my wife, Carol, couldn't be here tonight. We live in Olathe, and it's a school night for this one. So this is a bit of a late call. Um, you'll be hearing more about Sydney later on, but for now, this is just a gratuitous dad photo. But I want to start with a different kid, this kid. Um, I was born in Bristow, Oklahoma, and I lived there with my family until I was nine, and then we moved to Parsons in Southeast Kansas. Any Southeast Kansas people? Oh, well, all right, thank, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> uh, and I can look back on my life and pinpoint the exact day that I made a choice that would shape everything that would follow in my life after. And that date was August 9th, 1974. Does anyone know what significant event took place in this country on August 9th of 1974? Yell it out if you think you know it. Uh, Dr. Russell's on the right track. So on August 9th of 1974, President Richard Nixon resigned from office. He was the first president ever to resign. And as an eight-year-old getting ready to go into the third grade, I had an awareness. I, I knew that, that President Nixon was in trouble, and I knew that there was this thing going on called Watergate, mainly because Congress was holding hearings into the Watergate scandal, and every day those hearings preempted my favorite TV show, Uncle Zeb's Cartoon Camp. And so instead of being able to watch Uncle Zeb, I actually watched the Watergate hearings. And I remember watching it, and I, I was, I, it appealed to me, the idea that this was something historic. This was something that involved our government. I, I was only eight, but I was mindful of the fact that the, the, the political fabric of our country was being torn apart. And on the night of August 9th, I remember sitting in our living room in Oklahoma, and on TV were all these network reporters standing out live outside the home of Vice President Gerald Ford. And all these reporters were waiting to get the first picture or interview with the man who was going to be our next president. And I sat there and I watched that and I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be one of them. I want to be in that chaos. I want to be there to witness history being made. And I decided right then as an eight-year-old that I was going to work in TV news. And I never wavered from that goal. Um, as I went into high school, after never wavering from that through junior, uh, elementary school and junior high, um, as a freshman in high school, I started to make very practical decisions. I took a lot of English and literature classes because I knew it would make me a better writer. I got involved in debate and forensics because I knew it would make me a better speaker. And this is when the first F word really starts to take shape in my life. And that word is focus. Early on, I developed a very keen sense of focus on a singular ambition to work in TV news. For a young kid, I was incredibly driven and ambitious. I wrote letters to newscasters and reporters all over the country at the local and network level asking them, what, what guidance can you offer me? What should I do to succeed in this business? And most of them responded to me. 
I even did things that looking back on it, I probably shouldn't have been able to get away with. I was probably a little naive, but it worked out, so I'm not upset about it. The summer after my junior year of high school, I called all of the TV stations in my local market, which is the Pittsburgh Joplin market. And I said, I'm a high school student and I wanna work in TV news. So I wanna come in and just sit in your newsroom this summer. I just wanna learn anything I can learn. You don't have to pay me. And if I end up doing something, it's free labor for you and free experience for me. Well, two of the stations laughed at me. They said I didn't know anything. I'd be more of a hindrance than a help. But one of the stations, KSNF in Joplin said, okay, come on in. So the summer before my senior year of high school, I drove over three days a week that's a total of six hours round trip in the car every week just to sit there and watch and learn what I could learn. And initially, I think the people in the newsroom weren't real sure what to make of me, but as we started to form relationships, they started to talk to me and offer me guidance. They let me write some scripts and they would offer me critique on my writing. And eventually, the Weekend Anchor started using my scripts in the newscast. I was writing material for the newscast. I was editing video that was being used in the newscast. And by the end of the summer, I had shown myself to be responsible enough that they let me take a camera and a news car out to shoot stories. I was 17 years old. And so then it was time for my senior year. So I go to my senior year of high school, and I'm deciding where I want to go to college. And I made the decision that I was going to go to Pittsburgh State. It's a good program, and so for a broadcasting major, it was a good choice. But the primary reason why I chose Pittsburgh State was because I wanted to get a job at one of the TV stations in that market while I was going to school. So my very first day as a freshman at Pittsburgh State, I called KOAM TV Channel 7, the number one station in that market. And I said, a year ago, you told me that I didn't know anything and so I couldn't come in, but now I do. What's your excuse? And they said, we don't have one, come on in. So it started a process that first semester of my freshman year, just as I had spent the previous summer. And because I was in Pittsburgh, I could just drive there anytime I wanted to. I spent every minute in that newsroom. If I wasn't in class or doing homework, I drove out to the station to just hang out in the newsroom. And as I was doing this, I'm still writing scripts and shooting video, but I'm also learning other things about the business. And six weeks in to this process, a story broke on a Sunday night and there was nobody around to cover it except for me. And that night I had my first story on the air. And when I went into the newsroom the next day, the news director told me that they were gonna put me on payroll as a part-time reporter. I was an 18-year-old freshman six weeks into my first semester of college. And so um, my focus didn't waver from that. I still wanted to learn as much as I could learn. So I spent a lot of time with the producer and I learned how to produce. So when she went on vacation, I was the designated replacement for her to fill in. I taught myself how to use the weather computer. And I thought, there's no way I will ever need to know how to use the weather computer, but you know, anything I can learn is a good thing. Well, when I was 19, the second semester of my freshman year, our weekend weather anchor was in a Pittsburgh hotspot one night and struck up a conversation with a young lady whose boyfriend did not appreciate this, and he hauled off and punched the weather guy in the face. He looked awful. He could not go on the air. Well, the, the weekday weather guy was on vacation, and the only other person who could do weather, they couldn't find him. This was before pagers and cell phones. So the management was in a bit of a crisis, wanting to know who's gonna do weather, and I said, I will. I know how to use the weather computer, let me do it, and they did. And by coincidence, a few weeks later, the weekend weather anchor got another job resigned and he left, and I was named as his permanent replacement. I got my first TV job when I was 17, I was on the air at 18, and I was anchoring at 19 because of my focus. All of those opportunities happened for me because I made them happen. There were no jobs open that I applied for and that I got. I worked to make those opportunities happen for myself. And so for the next three years, um, I was working at a commercial television station while I was going to school. And I was still a regular college student. I was a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity. All right, let's just admit it. I'm working the hair and the mustache here. <laughs> You'll actually see that show up again later on. Um, it, was, it was in back then. So um, I was a member of Sigma Chi and had a great time in the Greek system at Pittsburgh State. I went out of the country for the first time when I traveled to Australia that planted a s seeds of a love of travel that still thrives in me today. And um, I was nearing the end of my time at Pittsburgh State. I was about to graduate and thinking about what was gonna happen to me next. 
And here's one of the things that I really want to relay to you guys tonight. When the day comes that you walk across the stage and you graduate from Baker, there are also going to be people walking across the stage at KU and K-State and Emporia and Pittsburgh and Park and Benedictine and Avila and the University of Missouri and the University of Nebraska and Colorado State and Stanford and Harvard. You are going to be competing against tens of thousands of people. What are you going to do to stand out? What are you going to do to find your focus and make opportunities happen for you? Maybe you'll win the job lottery and something great will just fall in your lap. Sometimes that does happen for people, but most of the time you have to work at it. So what are you going to do now at Baker? What internship can you have now to set that stage for you? What, what professional organization can you join to start making contacts so that you know people when you graduate from college? Start thinking about that now. For me, because I had made these opportunities happen for myself, I was able to go into a much better position when I graduated from college. Instead of competing against new graduates for smaller market TV jobs, I was able to apply to much larger cities and larger markets where more experience was required. And so the first job I had outside of college as a full-time um, weekend weather anchor and reporter was in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was 22 years old, had just graduated, um, I got to do some great things when I was in Corpus Christi. I got to interview David Brinkley, who was one of the great broadcasters of the 20th century. Um, I covered Hurricane Gilbert, which at the time was the strongest hurricane ever to come ashore near the U.S. coastline. I went to the Houston Space Center, um, in, uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, to cover the return of the first crew of shuttle astronauts to go up after the Challenger explosion. But while I was in Corpus Christi, my focus was also starting to shift. I started to realize that my real talent in television was behind the scenes. I enjoyed being on air, but when you're a reporter, you're responsible for about a minute 30 of the newscast. And as a producer, you're responsible for the whole show. And I was always more of a big picture guy. I was always up uh, with the producer, trying to learn um, you know, more about what they were doing for the show, and making recommendations of go to this story and then wipe to this story and use this graphic package. So I made the decision that I was going to become a producer. And here's another really valuable lesson that I want you all to take away tonight. The saying goes that it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's true. I had six jobs in television, six different TV stations. I got four of those jobs because I knew somebody. Now, I do not believe for a minute that I got the job only because of the connection, but it got me an audience. It got me an interview, and it got my foot in the door to be able to demonstrate to them that I was the best person for the job. And our weekend anchor knew a news director in Lansing, Michigan, who was looking for a producer. And she called him and told him about me. And we interviewed, and I got the job. So I moved from Corpus Christi, Texas, where it's like sunny and palm trees, to Lansing, Michigan, where there's snow in June. And my goal was just to get pure producing experience. And it was a lateral move. They're about the same size of television market, but I just wanted that producing experience. And once I got there, I realized that I knew about, more about producing than I thought I did, and that I was actually ready for bigger challenges. I, I wanted something bigger and better. So I set my sights on medium market jobs. And there was an opening at WJRT Channel 12 in Flint, Michigan, which is a market size comparable to like Wichita or Tulsa. And so I applied for the position. And what a coincidence that the news director in Flint used to work in Lansing with half the people that I worked with at my job. So, of course, he calls them and talks to them about me, finds out more about me, and I got an interview, and I got the job. So now I'm moving to Flint, Michigan, and about the same time another life change is going on in my life when I married my wife, Carol. So I was a Sigma Chi. She was an Alpha Gamma Delta. We were a Greek marriage made in heaven. And uh, we spent the next three years in Flint, and while I was at Channel 12, I really got to learn so much about the industry that I loved. Um, my producing skills, I, I can confidently say I became a really good news producer. Um, this was a, a remote newscast we did. We took our entire newscast on the road to Cedar Point, which is this big amusement park in Ohio, um, and a friend of mine who did public relations there at the time. Um, so at the end of three years in Flint, um, it was time to move on. It was time for bigger challenges, and now I was focused on major markets. I wanted to work in a huge city and really play with the big dogs. So there was a job opening at WUAB-TV in Cleveland, Ohio. 
which at the time was the 11th largest television market in the country. And, what a coincidence, the news director in Cleveland was good friends with my news director in Flint. So he calls him and talks to him about me. And through that conversation, extends me an offer for an interview, and I got the job. So in 1992, I became the senior producer for WUAB-TV in Cleveland. I'm like kind of center right there um, <laughs> in that picture. I'm 26 years old, and I'm producing the highest rated primetime newscast in the country in the 11th largest market. And it was my focus that had gotten me there. So I'm enjoying my time in Cleveland. And in 1993, um, the news director called me into his office and said that he wanted me to produce a three-part series of reports about Midwestern flooding that had taken place that year along the Mississippi River. And in 1993, that was the big story of the summer that everybody was talking about. There was really devastating flooding along the Mississippi. And he wanted me to take an anchor and a videographer and go somewhere in the Midwest. He said, I don't care what the story is, you research it, you find it, you produce it, and get it on the air. So in the course of my research, I came across this little town called Valmire, Illinois. And all the cities along the Mississippi had had some pretty devastating damage. But Valmire was literally wiped off the map. They were talking about rebuilding the town in an entirely new location from scratch. And I thought, that's a story. So we went to Illinois, and uh, I wrote and produced this three-part series called Valmire Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And when I worked in television, I never liked anything I did. The second it got on the air, I found a half dozen things that I would change about it, and I actually think that was a good thing. I was never satisfied with uh, the level of my work because I was always striving to get better. That Valmeyer series, I've watched it probably 200 times. I wouldn't change a thing. There was just something about it that came together in such a way. It was a great piece of television. I was so proud of that piece. And a couple of months after it aired, I found out it had been nominated for an Emmy Award. And of course, that was thrilling, right? I mean, as this little eight-year-old kid who wanted to work in the business, what an honor to get nominated for an Emmy. But also, at the same time, I didn't sleep for weeks. Because I thought, you know, if I don't win for this, I'm never going to win for anything. And on the night of the Emmy Awards, we won. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> I was nominated for four Emmy Awards, and I was lucky enough to win two. I have another one at home. It makes a great bookend. Um, and at the point that I won my first Emmy, I was on cloud nine. I had never been happier. I mean, this is everything I had worked for. It was all coming together. And I just felt like my skills in this major market had, had gotten me so far. And I also loved what was going on in a major market. I mean, I was in the big leagues. The, the pace and the pressure of a, of a major market newsroom was thrilling to me. And after she came into my life, opportunity came along too. I got a phone call from the NBC station in Cleveland after I won my first Emmy, and they said, we want you to come in and be our executive producer of Special Projects. So this meant that I was no longer going to be doing a daily newscast, I would only be doing the kind of stuff that I had done to get this. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm yours. And I took the job. So I go to WKYC in Cleveland, and I got to do some really cool things in that job. In 1995, I coordinated our station's coverage of the grand opening of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. If you're ever in Cleveland, go there. It's an amazing place. That fall, the Cleveland Indians made it to the World Series uh, against the Atlanta Braves. So I went to Atlanta and field produce our coverage from the World Series. In 1996, I was sent to Atlanta for three weeks where I field produced our coverage of the Olympic Summer Games. I covered the Olympic Park bombing, and I had an absolute blast with the crew that we sent down there. It was probably the best highlight I have of my career in television, aside from that. I love the time that I spent at the Olympics. But then in 1997, things started to change. All of a sudden, cracks started to appear in this rosy picture. In February of that year, I was promoted to managing editor, which meant that I was now the number two ranking newsroom manager. And with that job came a lot more responsibility. I was responsible for the content of all of our daily newscasts. So if a story didn't work out quite right, it was on me, and I had to answer for it. The hours that I had to work increased. On average, I was working 12-hour days. 
The stress was pretty intense. Major market newsrooms are pressure cookers anyway, and I was right in the, the heat of it. But this is what I had wanted, and so, um, you know, I was delighted that I had been promoted. But I could also sense a shift in my industry. There were things changing about the stories that we were covering. Now remember, I'm that little eight-year-old kid who was attracted to stories about government and politics. But there were so many stories that if it bled, it led, and superficial celebrity news. Um, do you guys remember Furbies? Do you know Furbies? Um, well, Furbies were the hot new toy that year. And we had a mandate come down from station management that every newscast had to have a Furby story. How many ways do you cover Furbies? So I was, just, I was in this place where I felt like things weren't as comfortable as they had been, but this was my dream, this was, this was the job I wanted, and so let's move on. Then in August of that year, I had accumulated five weeks of time between vacation and comp time that I never was able to take. So my wife and I decided to take a two-week trip to Australia. And while we were on this trip, I really started to realize how my job was affecting my home life. I started to realize I never saw her. I was working all the time. I never spent time with her. Um, the stress that I was feeling at my work, I was taking it home with me. And I really was mindful during this trip that, you know, when we get back home, I, I'm going to change that. I'm going I'm to make an effort to leave the newsroom earlier. I'm going to make an effort to not talk about work so much. But you know what? When we got back to Cleveland, um, I just got back in my bubble. I went back to work. I went back to doing my thing. And things went back to normal. Then comes October of 1997. The Cleveland Indians make it back to another World Series, this time against the Florida Marlins. So I go down to Miami to field produce our coverage of the first weekend of the World Series in Miami. And then the rest of the month, between the World Series and other things, I worked every day. I did not have a day off the entire month of October 1997, and most days I was working 14 to 16 hour days. It was killing me, and I felt as if things were coming off the rails. And I didn't know what that was going to lead to, but I'm thinking maybe, maybe I need another job in another city. Maybe, maybe that's what I need. And then the phone rang. And it was KCBS in Los Angeles. And they had heard about me, and they wanted me to come out and be their assistant news director. Well, first of all, <laughs> I felt like I was suddenly back on track. I love LA. It's a great city. It's a great news town. And it's the second largest market in the country. Only New York is bigger. And if you work for a station in Los Angeles, you're working for the network. They own all the stations out there. The network was calling me. I was 31 years old, and the network was calling. I was thrilled. And so I go home that night and I tell my wife all about this amazing opportunity that has fallen into my lap and how I'm going to be the assistant news director at KCBS in LA and isn't this great and all my enthusiasm and, and all my excitement about this. And she listened and she heard what I had to say. And when I was done, she looked at me and she said very calmly and very matter of factly, if you decide to pursue this job, maybe you need to think about going out there by yourself. That was a punch in the gut. By the way, she knows I was going to tell that story tonight. She gave me her blessing. It was a pivotal moment in my life. Because in that moment, something washed over me. And I suddenly recognized everything I had sacrificed to reach my singular goal. All I had ever wanted was to be successful in TV news. And I was, but I didn't have anything else. I never saw my wife. And now, a job might come my way that would end that. Thank God I was wired in such a way that I wouldn't let that happen. I knew a lot of people faced with that choice, and they chose the job. And all of a sudden, the next F word takes hold of me in a really pivotal way. And that F word was fear. I was terrified because I knew, deep down, I knew that my TV career was over. I, I knew that whatever was going to happen next I needed to walk away. But then the question becomes, what the hell do I do? All I have ever done my entire life was to prepare me for that one job. And so what am I good for? If I'm not doing that, if I'm not working in a newsroom, what do I do? And TV news wasn't just my job, it was my identity. It's who I was, it's all I had. And so the idea that my identity would be ripped away from me, that was a, that's a terrifying prospect. What would my friends think? 
I mean, my friends thought I had the coolest job on the planet, but they wouldn't understand if I just walked away from that. My family, who had always supported me, I knew they'd love me no matter what, but would they understand if I walked away from this? And what about my colleagues? I had developed a reputation in this industry, and I was really proud of that. So what would that mean? And I cannot adequately express to you the very dark place this took me over a period of several days. I just wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I felt like there was no next step. And that's a horrible feeling. And then it hit me. I had never known anyone who faced their fear and regretted it. I had never known anyone who had to make a really difficult, challenging choice, and when they faced that fear, they didn't come out of it on the other side in a better place. And as a result of that, I found some courage, and I walked into my news director's office, and I quit. I didn't have another job to go to. With my wife's blessing, I quit. And it's like, I don't know what my next step is going to be. I'll figure it out. But I was at a crossroads. Something had to change, and it had to change fast. And so I made that choice to step away from everything I had ever wanted in life. And for the next couple of months, I was a house husband. I had dinner ready for Carol every night when she got home. Um, I vacuumed. I scrubbed the toilets. Guys, here's some advice. Clean a toilet. The women in your life will love you. <laughs> There's applause for that. <laughs> And then I started to think about my next step, and it occurred to me I did have something valuable for something else. The skills that I had developed in media and the connections I had made in media were in demand for public relations positions. And so I made the decision to go into public relations. And so I applied for jobs, I had interviews, and I got a job as a media relations manager with an organization in Cleveland. And a funny thing happened when that started. I started to live. All of a sudden, I had time, right? I mean, all I ever did was work before, and now I was in a job that had fairly normal hours. I got holidays off. So my wife and I were able to travel more. I had no leisure activities in my life in TV. Now I, I learned to play golf. I mean, I'm a hack. I'm really bad at it, but I like golf. I took a whopper of a pay cut. I took a 60% pay cut. And I had never been happier. And it taught me that there are more important things in life than money. And right now, in your seat, that may be a really difficult thing to wrap your head around. <laughs> but there are more important things than money. And I realized that. And I'm grateful that I got that lesson. And I went back for a master's degree. The company that I worked for had a really good tuition reimbursement program. So I went to the University of Akron to get my master's in public relations. I thought it would be not only a really good personal challenge, but it would beef up my professional credentials. And once I got there, they asked me to teach a class. And it changed me. The first time I stood in front of a room full of college students, it was an epiphany. It was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. So you hear that everybody has, or the average person has like three career incarnations, and this was my third career incarnation. I was going to be a college professor. None of that would have happened if I hadn't faced my fear. If I hadn't been brave to face that fear, I'd probably be a divorced, bitter TV guy in New York chomping on a cigar. But instead, I made the decision to really slow down and live my life as opposed to living to work. And once I got into that classroom and I realized that that was the path I wanted to take, the next step was to go to Kent State University and get my PhD. So when I went to Kent State to work on my doctorate, the next F word becomes more prominent in my life. And that word was family. So my wife and I had always been very focused career people. Carol certainly to a lesser degree than me, but she's a CPA accounting finance person, and so she was also focused on her career. And so the idea of kids was not something that we had ever really talked about or thought seriously about, but now all of a sudden things were slowing down, we were definitely in a better place, and we were in our mid to late 30s, and we started having that conversation. It's like, you know, if we're going to start a family, now's the time. And so we decided to have a child. 
But we didn't. We were one of the many, many couples that faced infertility issues. And I will spare you the details of the emotional gauntlet that infertility introduces into your life. But we finally reached a point where we realized that the next step for us needed to be adoption. And that adoption path led us to China. I always thought I knew what love was. I love my family. I love my wife. But the first time I saw my daughter's face, about a month before we got on the plane to go to China, we saw her picture for the first time. And ever since this little soul has come into my life, she is everything. She is the happiest human being I have ever known in my life. And it doesn't matter what kind of day I have had, when I go home and I see her, all is well in my world. So now, my wife and my daughter, they're the center of everything, as they should be. Sydney is my focus now. Everything I do, everything we do, is focused on giving her the best opportunities we can and giving her the best that life has to offer. She's also the focus of my fear, because one of the things they don't tell you about parenthood is that once it starts, there's this constant underlying fear that never goes away. So the next time your parents ask you what you're up to, give them a break. And family. Family's one of the reasons why I'm here at Baker. My wife's from Gardner, I'm from Parsons, and this was an opportunity to come back home and guarantee that our daughter would know grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. And so family is the center of everything for me now, as it should be. And the time that I spend with my daughter, best time I have in my life. So what do I want you to take away from tonight? Find your focus, whatever that might be. What's your passion? And you know what, right now maybe you don't know, and that's okay. But whatever it is, identify your focus and work to make opportunities happen for yourself. What can you do right now that will lay a foundation for you to leave Baker and succeed in the way that you want to succeed? Face your fears. It's scary, but I'll tell you, the only thing worse in life than fear is regret. And you don't want to be sitting here 20 years from now wondering what might have been. So find your courage, be brave, and face your fear. You will come out on the other side in a better place. And embrace your family, whatever form that takes. Families these days are different colors, shapes, and sizes. Whoever the most important people are in your life, embrace them and make them the center of everything because ultimately it's the people that matter. So these are the F words that have shaped me through my life. And I hope that as you head down your path, you find the words and the experiences that help shape your destiny as well. Thank you.